You all will enjoy your food. Um, and we want to thank the wait staff of Potawatomi Hotel and Casino. Thank you for what you're doing. And the entire, uh, the AV staff from Potawatomi, thank you to Jeff Kennedy and Powered for Media for pulling this off. Thank you to all of our um, supporters and sponsors. Uh, uh, the New Pitts Mortuary, Michelle Pitts Luckett for helping sponsor the lunch today. Uh, we'd like to thank and acknowledge all of the um, child welfare systems and, and um, programs across the country who are participating today from New York City. We have Washington, D.C. Washington, in the house. We have Florida, um, Ohio, a number of other states, and we want to say thank you. And hopefully that this will be an uh, invaluable learning experience for us all and we can effect some change in our community. So the Color Child Welfare Conference 2023, our theme is Sawabana, affirming children and families through honor, hope, and healing. Sawabana is a Swahili term or greeting that simply means I see you, I value you, all of you. In fact, we see you, the ancestors. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your positive, your negative, your successes, and your failures. Too often times when black people enter into a space, we have to be very conscious of how much of ourselves we bring into that space. But today at the Color Child Welfare, we invite everyone to be who they are. We acknowledge you. We see you. Sawabana. Next, I'm going to introduce the Associate Director of Fresh Start Family Services. Mr. Sean Roby is the longest standing employee of the agency. We just hit 20 years uh, in business, and Sean has been here 19. At this time, he's going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. And, and thank you to be clear, the only black man in the state of Wisconsin who has water, his own water company. Thank you. Be, let's be clear about that, right? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Reed. It's been a ride. 19 years, everybody, and we've been fighting the fight, and we're not done. So thank you all for attending. I have the distinct honor to introduce Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. He is the cent Centennial Chair at Vanderbilt University and serves as University Distinguished Professor, professor of American, African American Diaspora Studies in the College of Arts, and Science and University Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Society in the Divinity School. He is also a New York Times contributing opinion writer and a contributing editor of the New, the New Republic and of ESPN's The Undefeated website. His rise from humble roots in Detroit to his present perch as a world-class scholar, noted author of 21 books, prominent leader in national media fixture, uh, testified to his extraordinary talent. Dr. Dyson has also taught other elite, elite universities like Georgetown University as a sociology professor, Brown University, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Columbia University, and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Dyson has won many prestigious honors including an American Book Award and two NAACP Image Awards. Ebony Magazine cited him as one of the 100 most influ influential African Americans and as one of the 150 most powerful blacks in the nation. <laughs> Dr. Dyson's influence has spread far beyond the academy in his roles of renowned, renowned orator, highly sought after lecturer and ordained Baptist minister. Thank you, sir. Without further ado, <laughs> let's give it up for Dr. Dyson. Love you, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much, my good friend, for that uh, gracious introduction. Wonderful brother. I want to thank uh, the Reverend Dr. Professor Reed for putting on this conference. And have y'all been having a great time or what? I mean, Dr. Roberts throwing down, Dr. DeGruy throwing down, 
Dr. Shireen throwing down. I mean, they just, I gave her a doctorate right now, you know. Uh, PhD, power to handle the devil. So it's, uh, I'm talking about Satan, I ain't talking about nobody else. <laughs> but uh, what a great honor it is to be here today and to have this opportunity uh, to chat with you a bit as a captive audience while y'all are eating. Uh, if you belch, don't belch too hard. And if you burp, don't make it too loud. And uh, please uh, continue to eat while I try to get you something to chew on uh, as well. Everybody good? I see y'all ain't talking, y'all eating. So that's a, <laughs> that's a good sign. So I've been asked to talk about politics and institutions and their impact on poverty and inequality in America, how politics and institutions shape um, poverty and inequality in America. We done heard already the brilliance of doctors Roberts and DeGruy about this and attorney Shireen about this. Um, and what I wanna do is to echo what they've already said and then add, since I've been given permission to talk about the politics of it in regard to these institutions, uh, to speak about some of the consequences of politics in our culture. Now, when we think about politics and institutions, and you all working in a field where you're asking questions like we just had in the session, how can we get this stuff in the courts? How can we get this brilliance of doctors DeGruy and Roberts into the courts and attorney Shireen? You would think that the courts would be interested. You would think that the major institutions of America would be interested, but as already been pointed out, the system was constructed in such a fashion that it is allergic to the kind of intense intelligence generated in cultural formations that have been associated with Africans in America and certainly with progressive thought or even poor white folk, poor native folk, poor indigenous folk, poor black and brown people because we have already been decided to be peripheral to the central operation of American society. So when we use all these terms about white supremacy, we ain't beating up on individual white folk. We're talking about the conscious or unconscious belief in the inherent superiority or inferiority of another group of people. So you ain't got to be wearing no Ku Klux Klan, you know, robe in order to be part of a white supremacist outlook. You could be a judge, you could be an author, you could be a psychiatrist, you could be a social worker, you could be a president of the United States of America in an orange apparition. I'm just warming up, I, I just, if y'all laugh, I'll keep going. If you don't, I'm gonna stay right where I is. So when we look at politics and institutions and their impact and how they shape discourses and realities of poverty and inequality, we, we, we got to look at the fact that we got major institutions out here already. When we think about public schools, when we think about the medical system, when we think about small business and big business, when we think about churches and organized religion, when we think about banks, when we think about the Supreme Court, when we think about the criminal justice system, when we think about the military, when we think about technology companies, when we think about organized labor, when we think about newspapers, we think about television uh, media and television news, when we think about the presidency, when we think about big business, when we think about Congress and we think about the police. These are some of the major institutions I got in mind when I say what I'm gonna say, is that good? Those are big institutions that determine American life. And when we talk about politics, how can we not help but start in Florida? We see what's going on there, and now we see that Governor DeSantis has announced his run for the presidency of the United States of America, joining Donald Trump on the Republican side and Tim Scott 
brother from another mother, to be sure. And what's interesting is that when we look at the politics, we're seeing Republicans who are ostensible advocates of the aggressive embrace of republic, the republic of democracy to defend it against what they considered communism and Russian totalitarianism and the refusal to acknowledge books and they saw in those societies that are totalitarian and authoritarian that they were banning books but now the Republicans are banning books. They're banning poems at inaugurations of a Harvard graduate speaking intelligently because they say it embraces CRT. They don't know the difference between CRT and OPP. I know some of y'all are 90s hip hop fans. You down with OPP? Yeah. Y'all know what that is. You nasty individuals, you. They talking about all of these alphabets, BLM, Black Lives Matter, BHM, Black History Month, DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and now A, Accessibility. They are talking about these alphabets, but these alphabets protect us against American amnesia. Why? Because Gore Vidal said we live in the United States of amnesia. And I would suggest that Barbara Streisand has supplied the theme song, not Taylor Swift. Barbara, y'all look old enough to know who Barbara Streisand is. She sang a song, was too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. So we don't want to remember. It ain't that we can't remember. We don't want to know what's going on. And when we talk about politics and institutions of American life and their impact and how they shape inequality, poverty and inequality, the reality is, is that we're living in a nation that is now antithetical to the very basis of intelligence that it claims that we as people of color and others are uninterested in. Now I'm confused. You tell us if you want to hide something from black folk, put it in a book. You didn't bother to say that you outlawed us reading, that's why we couldn't read it. It's not that we were unintelligent or uninterested, that we lacked sophisticated rational skills or un lacked curiosity. We understood that in America to be literate was to be outlawed. And now again, we are reviving a notion that a literate person ought to be banned, ought to be outlawed in American society. Why else would you ban the bluest eye from Toni Morrison? Why else would you ban, ban a book on Martin Luther King Jr.? Why else would you ban a book on Ruby Bridges, a six-year-old black girl who intended in New Orleans to make her way to school having to be protected by law enforcement? Why are we banning this? We are banning not only books, we are trying to ban black minds and black bodies. We are trying to banish black presence. We are trying to vanish the sense of presence that African peoples in America represent, that black and brown folk represent, that even poor white folk represent. We want to ban anything that doesn't look like a neo-fascist white evangelical outlook that is rooted in the intense preoccupation with white supremacist discourse that refuses to acknowledge the humanity of women, of children, of gay and lesbian, of bisexual and trans people in America. They just scurred everybody who don't look like them. So is it any wonder that when it comes to child welfare, when it comes to black child welfare, that we are dealing with political figures who have resisted the intelligence of black people, who are trying to banish books that we supposedly can't read or write. Frederick Douglass said, literacy or knowledge unfits a child for slavery. George Clinton said it a different way. Free your mind and your ass will follow. For those of you old enough to remember the 70s, never learned to swim. Parliament Funkadelic. I'm gonna come to a little baby in a minute, but my point is that we are living in a political atmosphere 
that is, ironically enough, anti-democracy, anti-celebration of the people, anti-black, yes, but anti-women as well. You've got Supreme Court justices in the wombs of women. And I'm getting to my point about child welfare, but I got to build up by talking about the politics of the moment. Trying to determine women's lives, bodily autonomy, trying to restrict access to devices and technology that allows them to extend their agency over their own bodies. The very state, according to conservative politics, should be out of the bedroom, and yet they're under your sheets. Trying to tell women they don't know nothing about something they don't know nothing about. Making no babies and raising no babies. They are not pro-life, they're pro-babies. When the lives are lived of the babies who get there, they have no consideration, no concern about child welfare, no concern about WIC and women, infants, and children, no concern about social agencies devoted to the reproduction of justice for those who are vulnerable. They want the babies, they just don't want the lives of the babies when they get here. And so, my brothers and sisters, when I think about these institutions, medical systems that are deeply and profoundly implicated in racist jargon and racist practice, they've done studies that said you can make $150,000 and be a black person, make $150,000 and be a white person. When you go to the doctor, there's a differential outcome premised upon pigment. They both got cash, they both got money, but say you present with a heart problem. The white person is treated with a far more aggressive intervention to prevent subsequent outcomes that are negative, where black people are seen to be able to endure pain far more routinely and therefore are not treated as systemically and as aggressively. We saw with the pandemic that black people with diabetes and black people with asthma and black people with high blood pressure were stigmatized. Why you got those problems in the first place? Why? Because there are food deserts in our community. Why? Because there's denied access to medical intervention. Most black and brown people who are poor use the emergency ward as substantive medical care. And by the time you go to the emergency ward, your particular medical problem will be so advanced that you could have dealt with it if you had preventive maintenance of routine access to high quality health care. These systems do not protect the agency or bodies of poor people and certainly not people of color. The Supreme Court, we got a black Supreme Court justice who says that he is insulted by white patronage. Oh, really? Just not when it comes to hooking up and buying your crib, taking care of your grandnephew, and providing you money. Your wife has text communications with politicians. She was advising them on January 6th as to what to do. But we are led to believe that the Supreme Court is the highest court in the land, impervious to politics, believing in the neutrality and the objectivity of jurisprudential rationality. It ain't so. And when we turn to Congress, when we turn to what happened on January 6th, the calendar is always January 6th for black folk. We always see in our, many of our white brothers and sisters so mad at a system that they helped to craft that when it doesn't turn out the way they want it to, they just get mad and start rioting mentally, metaphysically, verbally, rhetorically, assaulting the institutions of American democracy because they have not been privileged in seeking their own particular outcome. In other words, they had an election and the election didn't turn out the way you wanted it and now you're going to overturn the election by claiming that it was unjust. We see the rise of Donald Trump. I know some of y'all voted for him. God bless you. When we consider DeSantis, Trump may look a little bit better. 
But the thing is, Trump was a racist from the beginning, beating up on Mexican folk, saying that they were rapists. You the one grabbing it. You the one going to civil court and being judged to be a grabber. And don't be blaming hip hop for that. Right? Even Biggie said, some say the X makes the sex spectacular. Make me look you from your neck to your back then. Uh, damn, you look fine. Let me hit. What? You shine like a Rolex and what? He said, but if, all, if it's all right with you, we're loving. That's consent, Mr. Trump. He ain't raping nobody. He's not sexually exploiting anybody. He's seeking mutual gratification premised upon reciprocal affection. If you a real man, you ain't got to grab it, summons it with the integrity of your humanity. I'm getting to my point, but what I'm saying, we got the presidency that has been overtaken with jealousy and viciousness. Donald Trump was just mad he didn't have the rhetorical skills of the man who had the job before he did. They were mad at that man because he wore a tan suit. That was his major sin to many people. And yet he was out here working for working class people, trying to reconstitute American democracy for the masses. I wish he would have come out the White House sometimes in a terry cloth robe, with a skull cap on, with those Magic Johnson socks pulled up, with his newspaper in his hand. Yeah, what's up? I'm living in public housing. If y'all don't laugh at my jokes, I ain't. And so when we think about the institutions of American society, the police, black people don't hate the police. They hate police who hate us. They hate police who do damage to us. They hate police who can't tell the difference between a criminal and a citizen who called the police. We see these recordings of white people with machetes being taken down by the police without being shot. We see police people who run from white people who are unarmed with a gun on their hip and that white person gets into the police car and steals it. If you don't believe me, look it up on, 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 on YouTube. And yet if we make a wrong turn and our left hand signal is not operating, we end up dead like Walter Scott in South Carolina. We get shot in the back over minuscule and trivial offenses because the real offense is our blackness itself. The real offense that we present is the notion that we are black beings who claim uh, on the state a, a legitimate citizenship that we are consistently and continually and systemically denied. And so my brothers and sisters, when we talk about politics and institutions and how they shape poverty and inequality, you ain't got to be no genius to understand if you're in a bad school system and you are being undereducated or miseducated, if you're in a school system that is underfunded without resources because if the tax base of a particular municipality is responsible for funding the educational process, we know that poor black and brown people and poor white folk for that matter don't have the economic wherewithal to support an educational apparatus that would give them the most sophisticated forms of educational pedagogy available to the masses. Living in poor neighborhoods with poor schools, having poor access to low quality health care, living in food deserts where they don't have access to whole foods, they ain't even got access to half foods. They got mystery meat in the ghetto grocer. They got high sugar content cereal. They do not have the latest form of Cheerios that the Queen Bee Beyonce prefers. Any Beyonce tickets, let a brother know <laughs> before I leave. If you really, really believe in her, put a ring on it and give me a ticket. So what's interesting is that we live in a culture where the intersection 
of inequalities, where the convergence of denied opportunities relegates vulnerable people to the periphery of American opportunity. And then how it shapes poverty is it reproduces the lack of access as the premise of denying black and brown people access to institutions in American society. You can't get into the best schools. You can't get the best health care. You can't have access even to the best groceries. Instacart can't be called because you can't afford to get it because you ain't got a credit card because your credit is jacked up. And it's already been announced, you're living in high crime areas where insurances are out of, out of sight. And at the same time, police people are extracting penalties imposed upon vulnerable black and brown peoples in these communities. This is the systemic reproduction of poverty in America. And that poverty, by the way, ain't just black and brown. It's a whole bunch of white folk who are poor as well. Du Bois talked about this in 1935 in his book, Black Reconstruction. But he talked about the way in which poor white people were sold a bill of goods. They were sold the psychological wages of whiteness. Hey, at least you ain't a Negro. So they could go on, the powers that be, exploiting poor white people by making them believe they were inherently superior to black and brown people. And as a result of that, they were able to continually economically exploit, exploit poor white folk and at the same time reproduce the pathology of white supremacy by making them believe they were inherently superior to black folk. That's a con game that continues to this day. When we see the people that voted for Donald Trump believing finally that they would get their comeuppance, look, I don't deny the legitimacy of people who work hard, who don't see the consequences of their hard-earned money. I don't deny them the legitimate opportunity to vote for people they think will benefit them. But voting for a person whose belief is so deeply entrenched in white supremacist belief denies us the ultimate privilege as American citizens of living together in a communion, as Dr. DeGruy talked about it, where we believe our fate is connected to the next citizen in our country. We've already seen with the rise in crime rates, you can't go far enough into the suburbs to escape it. And then with the worship of the gun, we've got formerly white societies that were impervious to gun violence getting shot up routinely by your children who are out of order as well. And I live in Tennessee where they think the Second Amendment is the Second Commandment. The worship of the gun, the belief in violence to negotiate difference, road rage on the street, people killing other folk because they're angry or have a mental illness. The real deprivation in this culture is an appreciation for the other. So when we look at black child welfare, when we look at the systems that reproduce their, their inequality, when we look at systems that reproduce poverty and inequality, lack of access to education, lack of access to health care, lack of access to high quality food, lack of access to the possibilities of informal economies being generated by hard work, cutting grass or picking up snow and the like. When you look across the board, the denial of opportunity to these young people reproduces the pathology of a commodified black identity. What do I mean by a commodified black identity? The point is, is that, that yes, there are institutions available to us. There are networks and associations, some of which you are a part, that, that believe in trying to rehabilitate black folk and brown folk who are poor, and they have noble aspirations. But at the end of the day, they are part of a capitalist system that exploits the vulnerable for the benefit of those who are upwardly mobile. I had a brother in, brother in prison for 30 years, and when he would call home, the collect calls 
were nearly bankrupting my mother's economy. Privatized industry took over for state prisons, allowing the maximization of profit at the expense of the delivery of humane service. That's what I mean by commodification. And we see this going on in child welfare, where we're doling this out increasingly to private institutions that do not have the best interests of those children at heart. And then even when we deal with the state, we look at the institutions of American society, the court systems that are ruling against the very basic premise of democracy for black and brown people. We know very soon the Supreme Court will rule on affirmative action. And we know that will further deteriorate and diminish the capacity of black people to make claims on the state, not only for restitution against previous forms of oppression, but the persistence of inequality in America to this day. And when you think about it, not only those institutions, but the politics of race are quite interesting here too. Because when white brothers and sisters look at black brothers and sisters in say, highfalutin educational institutions, they think, well, you must have got here because of affirmative action. Y'all saw this going around on the Instagram the other day where a white senator gets up, state senator, asking a black state senator, he was his colleague, who went to Harvard. I'm just asking, sir, did you get in because you were black? Given the most visible empirical verification of your dumb acidness, <laughs> sir, this is Dysonian interpolation, I'm just his anger manager. I'm saying, uh, Jethro, where you been? And how you asking or asking if I got into Harvard because of my particular skin when it is manifest that your manifest inferiority wouldn't even justify you occupying a political space that so many other women and people of color might have occupied? So, so what white supremacy does is play a trick bag, trick game on many white brothers and sisters convincing them that they are inherently superior. I know y'all don't believe that in this room, but in other rooms where some white brothers and sisters are, there is that belief. And so we, we, we ju adjudicate this in terms of the Supreme Court. I'm telling you, I've been teaching at, I teach at the historically black college Vanderbilt. Because you can tell wherever I am is a HBCU, <laughs> right? Homeboy cutting up. That, that's just what I do. I'm telling you, I teach young white kids. They are as smart and as dumb as anybody else. It's the same average. Few geniuses, some very smart, a lot of average, and some people who ain't up to snuff. That's in every community. But somehow we've come to associate that with one community. Who could look at, if there's any advantage to Donald Trump being president, he has once and for all demythologized the notion of white superiority. Right? I mean, the man had 25 words in his vocabulary. Right? Huge. <laughs> right? See Dick run. And so my point is, is that the notion of affirmative action, as it has been assaulted in American society, is not historically correct or empirically verifiable. The greatest act of affirmative action in America happened with the GI Bill. Read Ira Katz Nelson's book, When Affirmative Action Was White, where he says returning soldiers got three things, money for a house, points to get ahead on a test for school and money to pay for it and access to a school seat and education, a house and, 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 and money to get a job. So a job, a house, and education. That's the holy trinity of affirmative action. And Ira Katz Nelson, a white man himself, says that this act of affirmative action was not called affirmative action and as a result of that was able to withstand scrutiny 
from the courts because it was in favor of the majority of white brothers and sisters. And so when it comes to the distribution of resources in this culture, and when we look at the institutions that recreate poverty and inequality, when it comes down to our children, if we deal in a political atmosphere where their books are being banned, where the notion that they should be educated is suspect, then how can we talk about rehabilitation through pedagogy and education when the very systems that we depend upon are themselves the purveyor of partisan and prejudiced conceptions of learning to begin with? And then more than that, those black bodies are not seen as worthy of the sort of support that we should give those who are vulnerable. And we will look at the political situation in which we live. I wish I could tell you different in 2023 that America had not come to a point where it continually propagates the notion of a two-tier, three-tier system where the inequality is so deeply entrenched that we are scarcely able to detect it. And when we do, we seem as if we are special pleading and belly aching for the reconstitution of American democracy when all we're asking is, as Martin Luther King Jr. said the night before he died, be true to what you said on paper. And so my brothers and sisters, as you do God's work, as you are the people's champion, as you look out for these vulnerable black and brown children and in many instances poor white kids, if you look out, as you look out for indigenous people who are victims of, of an ethic that is hypocritical and contradictory, black and indigenous kids are kicked out of school far earlier than many others and far more sternly five and six and seven and eight years old being kicked out of school. And when you get kicked out of school, you get sent to detention when you get back in. And detention is a warehouse, is a feeder system for jail. Jail becomes a warehouse for prison. The pipeline is pretty determined and very explicit. And so you have the responsibility of throwing a wrench into the system. You have the responsibility and capability of raising serious questions. I know that Drs. DeGruy and Roberts and Attorney Shireen talked about a radical reorganization and reimagining of a system which is what we fundamentally need. And in the meantime, we've got to interrupt the process of business as usual and ask much more profound questions about how we reconstitute American democracy so that all of our children can benefit. You as white parents must stand up against the Ron DeSantis's of the world. Not just black parents. These are white parents who are scared out of their wit, standing up talking about stuff of which they have little experience, with which they know little about, about which they know little. And at the same time, they are scared out of their minds because they have been, they have been spooked by managers and impresarios of white supremacist thinking that refuses to be fair and fundamentally just. And so these parents get on school boards and then begin to twist the meaning of American education, begin to pervert the possibility that real education asks us to challenge the status quo. When Ron DeSantis signed that anti-woke bill in Florida, he said, we don't want our children to be uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but discomfort is the basis of real education. If you ain't uncomfortable with your ignorance, you ain't going to learn nothing. I'm almost done. What is it that so many white brothers and sisters got against being woke? Why are they in love with being asleep? Frederick Douglass said, of all the penalties assigned to black people during enslavement, none greater occurred than for black people oversleeping. Why? Because you're interrupting my commerce. Why? Because the plants ain't being planted. The rice, the tobacco, the, the ability of black people to reproduce the telos of agrarian capital that was being interrupted. So they, they thought oversleeping was a sin. Thomas Jefferson 
said that the rapid descent of black people into sleep was an index of their inherent inferiority. Oh, damn, I thought it was working 19 hours a day that might have done that. Of course, there were some times when Mr. Jefferson wasn't sleep either. I don't want to go there. I don't see nothing wrong. <laughs> Sally Hemings, 14-year-old girl. There was no Me Too movement on the, on the slave quarter. 14-year-old girl being exploited. Was she in love with him? Thomas Jefferson having children with her, and yet you're doubting the rational capacity of the Negro in your book, Notes on Virginia. Undeniable genius, but perverted by a narrow conception of what blackness was about. And then they came up with a technical term, a Latin term, dysesthesia ethiopica. Boy, they will come up with some terms to diss a Negro. <laughs> dysesthesia ethiopica, a black kind of sleepfulness. And now that we woke, you want us to go back to sleep. Now you want to be sleep. Come on, white brothers and sisters. You got to tell your white brothers and sisters this ain't true. You, when you go to Thanksgiving, remind them you work in a system that has punished black children, that has punished black mothers, that has punished black fathers, that refuses to acknowledge them. That's after you eat your Thanksgiving meal. That's, don't be crazy. Eat your sweet potato pie, I'm sorry, eat your pumpkin pie first. <laughs> eat your dressing, I mean your stuffing. <laughs> eat that first. Then challenge granny. Or your son. Or daughter. Because it's a transgenerational phenomenon. And some of the most wicked beliefs occupy the minds of some of our youngest people. And so as I close, I want you to be Trojan horses in a system that we know has been corrupted, that is limited and finite, but is the available system through which we articulate our concern for the vulnerable. So I want you to get in and because you look the right way, you got the right education. Look, I'm a light-skinned Negro. I know about light-skinned privilege. Although light-skinned people been out, at least black men, for the last 25 years. <laughs> when, when Wesley Snipes stabbed Christopher Williams <laughs> in New Jack City, light-skinned was done. It was, it was over right then. Then came Denzel. Then came Idris. Uh, it, we were done. We're trying to come back now with Drake and Steph Curry, so please. We got a GoFundMe page for light-skinned Negroes. <laughs> but for so long, because you had curly hair and glasses and light skin, you were seen to be better, more intelligent, prettier. And dark-skinned black people were demonized. My daddy is from Albany, Georgia. He is blue-black. He was blue-black. And I saw the way people treated him, and that's just in black circles. Like a simian, like he was an animal, like he lacked intelligence and character. And so, my brothers and sisters, I get up in places because I'm a light-skinned Negro. And I speak the king's English to the queen's taste. Did you see that Doris Day movie last night? By Jing, it was amazing. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket, what's going on? Then, against my will, falling back on that ass with a hell of a gangster leg. Oh my God, I, didn't, I don't know where Snoop Dogg came from. Then Jay-Z comes out. I don't know where, God forgive me for my brash delivery, but I remember vividly what these streets did to me. Then Du Bois comes out. Two warring ideals whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Then Langston Hughes, then Toni Morrison, even old dirty bastard. Me and Mariah go back like babies of pacifiers. And so you be the Trojan horses because some of those children in foster care and some of those children in the system grew up to be highly intelligent, 
capable articulators of the desire of their people. They got master's degrees and bachelor's degrees and PhD degrees and MBA and NFL and, 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 and became rappers and entertainers. Not with the help of a system, but despite it. So I want you, good white brothers and sisters, to get up in the system, and then I want you to bring the intensity, the ferocity of your identification with the vulnerable to bear, and use a system that has been turned against them for their betterment. And when you do that, we can live up to the meaning of the American creed, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. Thank you. So very much. Twelve twenty-two. We got a, a few minutes to ask some questions. If you can raise the lights for me, AV staff, and over there is a microphone. We probably have time for about three questions, not statements. Everybody say questions, questions. not statements, and certainly not a dissertation. Okay, um, Doctor Michael Erickson has to get on the plane seriously. So I want you, if you if you have a question, if you can go over there to that microphone to my left, which will be your right. We can move pretty quickly. Okay, we don't have any questions and we can keep it. Okay, there go the microphone right there. Uh, Thank you very much for a wonderful speech. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you, how do you feel about defund the police? Well, I heard uh, Dr. Roberts earlier talk about defunding, right? Dismantling, reimagining, and uh, I think recovering um, the, the initial intent and the best design and desire. Look, I can understand why folk want to defund the police because they ain't got no problem defunding public education, right? They defunding social services all the time. So I think it makes sense for, as one recent municipality is trying, the stuff that you send police people out, say, for mental health problems, why are you sending them? Why don't we send a Dr. DeGruy? Why don't we send somebody who's been trained to deal with bipolarity, schizophrenia, paranoia, when these people are unarmed, right? and try to de-escalate the situation. So I believe in if we defund the police and refund others, we ain't starving the police, right? The police ain't starving. And, and look, I've, I've done some of those ride-alongs. Look, ain't nobody calling the police more than black people. Let's just be, I'm just being real. Ain't no, the black people be calling, look, mama, the eggs were not right. I'm gonna have to call the police on you, right? because we've been trained and learned, right, to do this. There are some like Raz Baraka in New Jersey, a mayor who says that defund the police is a bourgeois Negro preoccupation because the people in the inner city need help and relief from the pain. So we got to acknowledge that even if I don't believe in black on black crime, right, I don't even believe in the term, right? 93% of black people who died, died at the hands of black people. 84% of white people who died, died at the hands of white people. I don't hear, oh my God, what's going on with the white family? It's going to hell in a handbasket. It's just atrocious. These whites killing whites, you know, whitey on whitey crime is really horrible. I don't hear nothing like that, right? So, but at the same time, we got to deal with it. Now, having said that, let me say something tough on those of us who are progressives. We got to, you, you got to have strategy. Do you want the commercial or the product, right? If you know from the get-go that folk are going like, oh, what the hell? Come up with another word to mean the same thing. Do what they do. Say some stuff. No, when I get on the Supreme Court, I will not deal with Roe versus Wade. It's settled case law. 
Didn't three of them lie and say that? And what did they do? Turn that thing upside down like it was an apple turnover, right? Like an upside down pineapple cake. So I ain't saying lie, but I'm saying be strategic, right? And we don't have to call it defund the police. We can call it making bank upon the denial of certain strictures against the police. I don't care, right? Let's call it law enforcement redirection. How about that? There you go. Law enforcement redirection, right? LED, let's lead the way. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, I work with the, I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. public school system. And so my question is, where would you um, suggest or say that education, educators should start to dismantle the system that is stacked against our students of color, especially our um, black boys? Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. Let me tell you, I came up in Detroit, Michigan. I'm, I'm 64 years old. I was born in 58. In 1968, Mrs. James, I will never forget her, was teaching us black history. And my mama told me that, because it was a segregated school. I mean, we didn't know no difference, right? That's all, I didn't go to school with white folk until I got a scholarship to go out uh, when I was near, damn near in college. So my mother told me that black parents went to the white principal a completely black school except for the principal, Miss Dorothy Christensen, I never will forget, and complained that she was teaching kids black history and that wasn't going to have nothing to do with their lives. Hmm? Well, if it, ain't hurt, it helped nobody else, it damn sure helped me. Hmm. I'm here, I got a PhD from Princeton, right? And that's because of Mrs. James. So first of all, teachers can do a whole bunch they can, I don't care what Ron DeSantis say, teach and can't teach and all that. Teach young people to free their minds. Teach young people to think critically and to think for themselves, number one. Then have parents join school boards. Because the thing is, even if you ain't got no kids, right? All these people who, who are on the school board ain't got no kids. They, 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 those kids can't be that unlucky. I mean, in, in some instances, in some instances, I'm not saying all of them. So my point is that why don't we join some of those school boards too, number two. And number three, look at some how other communities do it, right? Saturday school, freedom school. Can you imagine? I'm sure Dr. DeGaru would volunteer. I'm sure Dr. Roberts would volunteer. I would volunteer. Can we have Saturday schools where I don't care what they're teaching in the local public schools, we're going to give you what the real is. We more exciting. We're sexier intellectually. We got better jokes. We know more lyrics. And we just know the shit. So the thing is, is that if we could gather that momentum through your churches, right? Or your synagogues or your temples, wherever you go to church, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ola Quran, the Bible, the art of motorcycle maintenance, whatever it is that you read, if we could use the local church to reinstitutionalize black pedagogy, do you know how far ahead we would be? So off the top of my head, those are three things. But just keep teaching. We love you, teacher. We love you. Um, I am a homeowner in an underserved community, of mm -hmm. which I very much believe in the potential of. Mm -hmm. My question is, how do I better serve my community um, alongside the programs that have already been um, in place, but how do I better serve my community in a way that will actually enact change, that will not overtax me or put me or my family in danger because historically we don't exactly protect our leaders. So how do I make a change without putting myself in danger, my family in danger, and without overtaxing myself? You can't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you, you look, look, I'm not saying it should be you, I remember asking Jesse Jackson once, I said, how did you, at 25, get up there and get on Martin Luther King Jr.'s staff and he didn't even know you? He said, Dr. Line wasn't that long to join. Because <laughs> even, even Ralph Abernathy, remember him? Dr. Ralph Abernathy, who was his best friend when King won the Nobel Prize. Now imagine, this is 1963, he won it for 64. $54,000. That's good money right now. Imagine how much money that was back then, 
Ralph was like, I need half that dough because they could be shooting me and not you. Right? The point is, real leadership is always a risk. Right? Even for, quote, ordinary black people who don't want to put your families at risk. And I ain't mad at you. Why should we have to put our families at risk to get what everybody else has? But Dr. King said, I'm tired of marching for something that should have been mine at birth. <laughs> right? Right? I got the king down, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I hear you, Tupac. But so, <laughs> so the thing is, is that what you do is extremely important as, quote, an ordinary black person in an ordinary situation where you, obviously highly intelligent, if you don't mind me saying beautiful black woman, chocolate charming, if you can be a center of black knowledge, go to your local PTA. How about this? Go to your local city council where they're making all these restrictions you don't know nothing about. State legislators are ruining and reigning in America, right? When they kicked them two boys out in, in Tennessee, how stupid do you have to be? You knew you were going to make them martyrs. They're going to come back stronger, dummy. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that these state boards are making a difference. If you went to the local council meeting and began to talk about what things are being zoned in your neighborhood and why don't... Why doesn't your neighborhood get a bigger piece of that pie? And then take your kids with you so they can see the advantage of advocacy and standing up for yourself, right? Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Doing what I do, I, I get death threats every day. I get white people writing me letters and notes and emails calling me nigger. I have to correct their grammar. I said, oh, Niger is a river. <laughs> I think you meant nigger, okay, I was not sure. But given what I got, that's Reverend Dr. Professor Nigger to you. All right, that's, that's what I do. But I gotta say this, but I go to school every class with two armed guards because I understand that what I bring and what others of us bring in that knowledge threatens the self-regard and the notion of white supremacy because you ain't gonna have that in front of me, Holmes. Because you ain't gonna never say dumb nigga and Michael Eric Dyson together unless you my homeboy say you dumb nigga, <laughs> right? So my point is that it is a price. There is a cost. It's not just signing books. It's also being protected by law enforcement because certain white folk are angry at me and want to hurt me. There is no way around that. But if you can go undercover and do what you're doing and mostly escape the venom, but when you become public, you open yourself in ways, right? Look at the, the women in Georgia who were just counting votes. And because of Donald Trump, they were terrorized and had to leave their homes. I can't promise that won't happen to you. But what I can promise is that you will feel so good about standing up for yourself and your community that you will think that it's worth the price that you have to pay in order to defend your babies. And that's really it. Thank you so much. Napoleon, if you can take Dr. Dyson downstairs. Everybody give Dr. Dyson a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Dyson. About them Beyonce tickets, let me know what you're doing July 22nd. We're going to be down in...